Wayne Wang was born in Hong Kong in 1949. He moved to the United States when he was 17 and eventually became one of the most important directors in Asian American cinema. Films like Chan is Missing, Tim Sum, and The Joy Luck Club centered around Asian American characters. They often depicted the process of emigrating from Asia and integrating into the American society. Although his films are not without controversy, many Asian audiences embrace the films as accurate representations of their lives. Subsequently, Wayne was courted by Hollywood and found mainstream success by making films like Made in Manhattan with Jennifer Lopez and Ray Fiennes, and Anywhere But Here with Susan Sarandon and Natalie Portman. Hi, I'm here with Wayne Wang. He's probably one of the most important filmmakers, if not the most important Asian-American <laughs> director alive. Uh, he's responsible for China's Missing, which is a sem seminal film in um, Asian-American cinema because it was one of the first films that portrayed or humanized Asian-Americans instead of making them supporting char characters or caricatures. It actually showed them as real people. And of course, he made the joy like club. Oh, John, everything all right? How is everything? Oh, excellent. Bravo. Best. Best quality. <laughs> and he's here in Singapore because he is showing four of his films uh, at Golden Village Showcase. Uh, the four films are... Dim Sum, Dim Sum Smoke, Smoke, uh, The Joy Luck Club. Joy Luck Club. As well as Last Holiday, yeah, right? Why these four films? Well, because I think it it gives people um, a kind of a nice perspective of the different films I've done. I think Dim Sum um, was one of my you know first small, very personal films, and it's very similar to Thousand Years of Good Prayers, which is being released now, the newest film. Um, Joy Luck Club, obviously, because it's a classic film. Uh, Smoke is personally one of my favorites. One of mine uh, also, yeah, yeah. I love it. And then uh, Last Holiday was never, I, as I understand it, never released here. And that's also quite personal to me because my father, um, you know, who's a very careful man um, and worked really hard all his life. Um, and, and, you know, when he was 87 and he was still quite young in my mind, he was hit by a car and passed away. Okay. So I felt like he never got a chance to really live his life. And the story is about Queen Latifah, who plays a character a bit like this. And in a way, it's a tribute to my father. Uh, and it's a very fun, commercial, action-packed film, you know? It's a lot of snowboarding and yeah. things like that. So anyway, I'm, I'm really, really glad that I could show that film here, too. Okay. There was a period of time when uh, your detractors and your critics said that, uh, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. you kind of sold out because you started making Hollywood films right. instead of films that examine the uh, Chinese-American right. identity, I suppose. Well, I, I felt like I have kind of uh, exhausted at that time my Chinese-American American. identity with the Joy Luck Club. I had done like four or five in a row. And I wanted to learn to do like a real commercial film um, and also try to find some you know personal content in them I mean if you look at a film like Anywhere But Here I identify with a lot of things about that movie and it's very personal to me and yet you know I tried to make a fun you know studio movie like Last Holiday was the same thing too there's something that I always have to kind of you know identify with and feel for before I kind of do them and at the same time, I'm making a lot of money, so... <laughs> yeah. It, so. Is there something about uh, Chinese, American, uh, Chinese American community that America still doesn't understand, do you think? I think there's a lot that Americans don't understand still. Like, for example, I was talking with another journalist earlier about the fact that Americans uh, still don't get that the Chinese born in America and raised in America are just as American as Joe Smith down the street. They mm. speak English with no accent at all. They, they are brought up just as American, and some of them don't speak any Chinese. And that's something that's still hard for people to get around, you know? So like in the Joy Luck Club, people f 
I think finally saw some real Chinese who are real Americans also. But surely, even the second generation, or the third generation, mm -hmm. well, maybe the second generation still uh, experienced some kind of conflict in assimilating. Yes. If that, anything, they have to be different when they're at home right. uh, than what they are with their friends or colleagues. Yes. I think when I was you know, finishing college, I was more, a lot of the generation, second generation Chinese Americans were my friends, and they had that conflict, and they had to, you know, deal with it all the time. But the new generation, the younger ones, you know, now don't care, <laughs> and don't have that problem at all. Right. You know, they, they are who they are, and they don't have an identity problem, and they just go on with life. And if you go, you know, to the big cities at least, let's say New York and Manhattan, you know, everyone is there. Nobody speaks English, first of all. You go downtown, everybody is speaking, you know, some language from somewhere in the world. I think, I think the globalization and the, and the Internet really has helped that, too, because people, you know, really are less concerned about so-called pure culture and pure language or whatever. It's like everybody's so mixed up, like Singapore here, you know. <laughs> is that something you regret? Uh, regret? You yeah. mean in my life? Uh, you know, seeing uh, Chinese Americans who don't seem to have a shred of Chinese identity. identity. Um, I regret it a little bit. I remember, you know, for me, um, when I overcompensated and became so American, I felt like I have neglected my own culture and my own upbringing. I had to go back to Hong Kong and kind of re-immerse myself into that and try to more organically sort of, you know, get that back into my identity and my system. I feel like in the long run, it, it's still good for you. It's a good, you know, mirror of some kind. You've managed to span uh, the whole spectrum from uh, art films to right. uh, Hollywood films. What kind of what are the differences between the two systems and as an artist? What are the constraints? I suppose yeah. that each system well, puts they, on you. They both have their, you know, advantages and and their constraints. Let's say you take something like Made in Manhattan. I could probably get anything I want if I say I want a pink elephant. They'll bring <laughs> it to me in fifteen wow. minutes. You know, <laughs> um, but the constraints is that you have you have to block four blocks of Park Avenue, which is like Archer Road here or something, and every extra is, is a paid actor that you're using. There are, you know, 20 big trucks parked somewhere, and you have a crew of 200 people. Um, it's very hard to, you know, be creative under that or to, to change something, you know? Right. Whereas a film like Thousand Years of Good Prayers, I had maybe less than 20 people on the set and basically one big truck. Um, I could control everything, and creatively, if I wanted to change something, I could change it right away, you know? So, I don't have the access of the pink elephant, but I can be more creative. So, that's kind of, I mean, a way to summarize the, the, the you know, pros and cons of each. You've also worked with uh, a lot of extraordinary actors like Javi Keitel mm -hmm. and William Hurt in Smoke, right, right. Uh, Susan Sarandon and Natalie right. Portman in yeah. Anywhere But Here, yeah. Ray Jer Fiennes. Jeremy Irons, Jeremy Ray Irons. Fiennes. Gong Li in yeah. China bo Chinese yeah. Box. Yeah. Um, well, is there <laughs> a favorite? Well, n not really. I think there, the one thing that I've learned is that all these actors are so different. And they give you, you know, something so different because of who they are and what they are and how they like to work. I mean, uh, to give you an example, I mean, William Hurt and Harvey Keitel are both great actors. You know, Harvey refuses to rehearse because he says the rehearsal, you know, <laughs> takes out his, his, his freshness. Right. So what he did during rehearsal was he brought his assistant who read his lines and he would just walk to where <laughs> I, I told him to walk. Um, William Hurd loves to rehearse. He just keeps refining it and keeps, he keeps on doing it. And he says, if a line doesn't work, I don't want to tell you that it doesn't work. You're going to have to hear it because I'm going to try my best to do it. If it doesn't come off, then you, you should hear it. So I love those different styles of acting and they're equally valid. You know, when you put them together, in a scene, um, 
they are just like magic um, because you know each of their styles and how they do it is so authentic in the end also so what was uh, what was it like working with Susan Sarandon and Natalie Portman? she's well they're, they're a real joy to work with the two of them are the two most professional most talented and most fun-loving actresses I work with. Wow. We work so fast. We finish shooting usually at like, like four in the afternoon. So we're just, because they're so good. They're, they're so well-prepared. They come in and they're not boring because they're well-prepared. They actually find creative things to do with it. And, you know, after two or three takes, we've got it and we're done. Yeah. You know, so those two are also a joy to work with. <laughs> Natalie Portman is such a great instinct the instinctive act actress and I think she's gained more experience now and trying different things which I really think you know it's, it's great for her Was it your choice or the studio's choice to cast Ray Fiennes in Made in Manhattan? Which it was very both odd. our choice actually okay. yeah because he hasn't done that kind of a role yeah. sort of the leading man kind of role <laughs> And All I of us really, were surprised I think yeah, to see him there. I, and I really like his work so um and and uh, at that time he was also quite popular mm. uh, so so the producers and the studio actually agreed to use him and i thought it was a it was a great combination you know he for another one it's it's also interesting works works you know he doesn't work psychologically on the character as much although he knows him pretty well psychologically but he works from the outside which is so interesting he wants to know what he's wearing specifically what his hair looks like so he works from the outside to build the character everyone's different and that's why they're so fascinating all of them what about jennifer lopez i mean I'm yeah <laughs> she's I mean, not really an actress or i wouldn't call her well, an she, actress she's a very good actress she's um, a star but she's a star but she's a very good actress if you look at what was that um, Steven Soderbergh film with George oh, Clooney? Out of, out of Sight. She's great in she that. She was great in you know? that. Um, she is very good. I mean, one of the problems I had on Made in Manhattan was that she was going out with Ben Affleck. And there were more, <laughs> more paparazzi going on, you know, on the set than anything else. So I had to deal with a lot of that. But she's, she's the ultimate professional. She's always ready and there and comes on set and she's prepared. Um, but I think she hasn't done her best work yet because I think she needs to needs to have a real challenge of some kind because okay. she I think it's a real good actress. Right. Yeah. You just came from America, of course. Mm. You, you flew in last night. Yeah. Um, what is the mood like in the U.S. right now because of the bad? <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. It's kind of scary. I think the financial crisis is beginning to really hit, and it 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 sort of has its effect all the way down to. Like, you know, the real working class were already suffering because, you know, everything is so expensive and, you know, they're probably losing their jobs also. And now at the same time, you know, they can't even, you know, get a loan or anything. So um, I think all in all, the financial crisis is really scary. Um, the elections is coming up. Yeah. What are the sentiments on the Asian American ground, I suppose? Obviously, because of Obama, I mean, to have an ethnic minority as the president, you know, everybody is really, you know, excited. cheering for that. Yeah. Very, very excited. So, you know, knock on wood, I hope <laughs> that that works out. It's only like 40 days away or less even. So, okay. yeah. Um, you've started to go more on the Internet, mm -hmm. right? You found your actor for Princess in Nebraska, an actress from for Princess of Nebraska from the internet. Yeah. And you also put Princess of Nebraska on the internet. Yes. Why this somewhat aggressive? Well, I, I, I feel like the last few years, especially uh, talking to more and more people, that the internet is finally becoming a place where people actually not only watch short movies, but watch full length movies, buy things, um, you know, do a lot. Uh, of things on the internet um, and because Princess is shot with a whole sort of new media kind of style in mind the framing is very tight um, um, and it's shot kind of with similar camera to this very much on the on the get-go it's a little bit like a jazz riff so um, it's a tribute also to the French New Wave in its style so in a sense I think it, it's uh, appropriate for it to be 
in the early days of the internet to be you know shown there rather than the movie theater whereas the, the other one thousand years of good prayers is actually a very formal it's shot for film uh, it uses a lot of two shots so you really have to see it projected big uh, princess is it, it's a different kind of a style but you know it, it's also you know just as well you know uh, uh, seeing it big as a as a film too, because it's also thought of and as a diptych with Thousand Years of Good Prayers. Like in in Paris, actually, they shoot show the two films together. A lot of the film festivals show them together too, because the two films are really by the same author from the same anthology of short stories. And for me, uh, I I find they're very related, even though the, though the styles are very different. The first film was about a woman in her late thirties who really is running away from her past, from her experiences during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and the second one is about a young girl who's only 19, and she grew up during the economic boom of China, and really doesn't have a past or an identity, and, and is trying to find herself. So in that sense, it's very connected. Um, mm, okay. yeah. But how do, uh, how do movies on the internet... Uh generate revenue, I suppose? Well, I guess, you know, right now um, what happens is that there are corporate sponsors that sponsors uh, YouTube and this this portal called, um, you know, the screening room. And then there are also specific ads that are sold um, around the film, too. They're not within the film, not like TV, but they're, they're you know, uh, when you first start to get into the film, they're on the sides, but you can kind of you know, then go to full screen, uh, but they have ads at the beginning at the end, I think. So that's how, you know, um, um, you know, they're getting money and we're getting money. And the other way to do it is that I think when a film becomes, um, you know, known on the internet, you can then sell the other revenues better, such as DVD or TV or cable or whatever. So um, it's a different way of thinking because the film is independent. The film was made relatively low budget, so it seems very appropriate to sort of you know use this this route. And the other thing that's difficult in the U.S. is that theatrical distribution is so expensive to get a film out. So if you get a film out theatrically and it doesn't quite do great, you start losing money already, and then you know. Uh, then it's not too good for everyone. Well, some people are saying indie cinema is dead. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see it from falling audience attendance rates uh, and also from the lack of interest in it. Um, yeah. Why do you think that is so... I think part of it is because the big sort of event films that Hollywood make are so powerful mm -hmm. that it takes over a lot of the audience. I think people's home personal television systems are so good, they can actually see an indie film at home and see it quite well. Uh, those two things hasn't helped the American indie you know, scene. Um, so I think the, the indie scene needs to sort of challenge itself and make really interesting films. You know, not try to copy you know, Hollywood films um, or make a lower budget kind of Hollywood films, but try to come up with something really fresh and different. You know, okay. Like, let's say Blair Witch, which really, you know, created a huge audience by shooting something so inventive and so creative and different. Okay, Wayne Wong, thank you so much. Okay, thank for you for being with us on Razor Pop. All right.